listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the Hasbro Video Store Podcast. I'm your host, William. Joined daily Sean. Hello. And on this episode, we'll be discussing Shutter Island, the first movie we've covered by Martin Scorsese that I believe on this podcast. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's the one of the few things he's done that's kind of genre-ish versus... Well, at know, least horror genre-ish, yeah, you know, yeah. gangster and all that stuff. But Yeah, well, I guess like, you know, gangster movies like Goodfellas or, you know, stuff like Taxi Driver, even those can be in genres those are not genres people refer to as genre films. Yeah. Um, Because, like, Goodfellas, you know, could be, like, an Oscar contender. Yeah. Um, Because, like, the crime drama element uh, is, you know, something that's looked upon fine by Academy viewers or, you know, traditional critics. But if you go into the more horror, thriller um, type, you know, area, then you're, oh, you're just a genre film. And then it kind of some makes, makes things, like, somewhat less than. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some instances, but you know, Shutter Island's one of those movies that's kind of like the the trailers and stuff for it did make it look kind of like a horror thriller movie, and it's from Martin Scorsese who has all the pedigree, starring Leo DiCaprio, who's a huge star, and Mark Ruffalo and Ben Kingsley, so you know, well respected actors. So it's one of those movies that brought you know kind of shined a light on that. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people who aren't horror fans would have watched that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I don't think that that then makes them go out and watch stuff, you know, other things as far as I know, but I mean, yeah. but it is a movie that, you know, came out years ago and I think that's one that, um, it's on Amazon prime to watch now. You can buy it anywhere. It's one of those movies that if you've seen it before, cause that's all in theaters and hadn't watched it since. So I think rewatching it's like, okay, is what I remember of this movie, does it all hang together watching it a second time? So that's what, that's a big element of that. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But before that, we'll go through some recent news and things we've been watching. And on the news front, um, let's see, was it? We just watched the trailer for the Slender Man movie that keeps getting shifted around. Because mm-hmm. that's a movie that I think was supposed to come out like a while ago. And they moved it up into the future. And then they moved it back. And now it's coming out like in August. And because um, like sometimes on videos we'll post, we'll see people make comments like, oh, all this PG-13 garbage is terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Like anything that's not R rated from 1982 is a piece of trash. <laughs> and, and you see that commentary on the comments on any big horror site when they announce a movie and all this stuff. But this is one of those movies where it's like that does look like PG 13. Um, like without seeing the movie, haven't read the script, any of that stuff, just seeing the trailer, it looks just like a PG 13 loud sounds jump fest for teens. It, it almost seems like it's out of the late 90s, early 2000s. You and, know, watching that trailer, yeah. it's it's if you know Scream wouldn't have been big and they did a bunch of slashers and stuff. Yeah, it would. It seems like if something else like urban, like supernatural, more, yeah, supernatural. Ish. This would have felt like a middling based on the trailer. Yeah, one that you would probably forget about, you know, or or pass up. But yeah, Slenderman. Like, when did that start getting popular? Was that on Reddit first? No, so or was that the game first? So it started out on, I think, the forums on Something Awful or Mm -hmm. one of those sites, and it was to make up a fake supernatural story, you know, fake scary story. So somebody had photoshopped a few pictures of it with, like, little kids and, like, the Slender Man in the background. And then it started to pick up steam, and then people made, there was, like, um, the, something Hornets, Marble Hornets, or some series online that was about Slender Man that was kind of like a faux documentary thing about like somebody actually encountering Slender Man. So that got to be popular. And then there was a bunch of kind of internet lore that propped up around it and they made like that one game that I think was called Slender. I don't remember. It's yeah. where you walk around the woods and try to find pages and Slender Man is stalking you. And I'm sure there were some other similar games because I remember I actually played that because it was on PC and it was free. So I just played it and it was creepy and fun. Um, but you look at, to me, you only play it like two or three times. You're like, Oh, okay. I kind of got what happens here. Cause you just walk around the woods and something follows you. But, um, so it kind of became big in internet lore and became really big. And like the creepy pastas with like teens and younger teens who would just read all that stuff on the internet and all those forums and the places that they look at on the internet. And I think Tumblr had a lot of stuff about it. And it seemed like it peaked a few years back because there was those two younger girls that tried to kill their classmate 
claiming that Slender Man told them to do it because they wanted to go live in the woods with him or something. And then there's a documentary about that but call, um, called Beware the Slender Man that I, I had watched a while back. And I thought it was, you know, fine documentary. Um, it just shows, like, when kids get these... I think a lot of times it's kids that have issues and they just latch onto anything to then become the um, driving force behind yeah. that and the outlet for it. So it could have been anything they came across. They would have had a similar result. It's just it just happened to be Slender Man that they focused in on. If it would have been the 90s, it would have been Jinko Jeans and Marilyn Manson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been like, well, the beautiful people, the beautiful yeah. people. Now. Yeah. So, yeah, it's one of those things where I think that the popularity of Slender Man as a pop culture phenomenon kind of peaked a few years back. It's, so this movie seems about five years too late. And it's just terrible that there was actually tragedy. You know what I mean? Related to this, like, I don't know, you know, making a film like after something like that happened. Yeah. You know, like it's uh, whatever they to make a buck. Here's so now that we have went through that in the Internet history and chronology yeah. and figured out, OK, Sony Screen Gems or whatever is making this film five years too late. Yeah. You know, we saw the trajectory. Ideally, here's what you do. You figure out a couple different ideas. You, you know, you maybe write a few different scripts on a few different ideas. You register the trademarks. Then you start trying to get it out there yeah. organically yeah. to see if the community starts building stuff on it. And maybe they might start making like a little short films and stuff. Yeah. And then if it starts rolling, put that film in production and then pull the rug out from everybody and say, Hey, we have the copyright of this character. Yeah. And then you put your film out like a year later and at the height of it. And there you go. You just have like three of those ready to go. Yeah. Cause like something that I've read up on a little bit. So the reason you don't see a lot of these different, um, creepy pasta, mm -hmm. like fictional horror characters, people created and made like internet lore around and made it, all these fictional ideas about it. the reason you don't see a lot of those get made into movies is because if it was kind of an, um, just a, if somebody created the concept for it and put it out there, if you take their version of the character and you make a story based on that, you have to then get the rights from them to do that. If somebody had written, you know, the initial guy who created like the imagery and all that stuff around it and just the basic mythology, yeah. You would need to go to him and license it if you wanted to use any of those ideas and concepts. The entire idea of a dude in a white suit that kill, like kidnaps people, you could probably do that without stepping over the original story elements. But you would just have to have your legal apartment vetted out to make sure that you were not close enough that you have to pay these people rights. Yeah. And then a lot of times the main concept of the character is one thing. Maybe it's, you know, kind of community created and there's no one person credited with it and you can't really there's really no one to come at you for the rights but there's specific elements of the backstory they came up with in a short film or some you know short story they wrote then you do need to license that from them or to get the option from them to use their iteration as you know like they would get like story by credit in the movie script so that's the reason a lot of those don't get made into movies because it's so um so layered and so many people own so many elements of the character and if you want to present it in your movie as the character is mostly known on the internet, you then have to reach out to every single person that had a hand in creating the backstory that leads up to what that character is mm -hmm. to get the rights from. So it's just a rights nightmare, which is why they don't do a lot of those types of well, things. Well, too, like I was half joking about the way to do that, but you know, it would it would be a good, good way to get viral marketing out. But yeah. the story creation thing, like you see screenwriters and studios all the time, like they don't want unsolicited pitches because yeah. if they happen to look at an idea, yeah. you know, and then use it, then you can come back and say, hey, I sent them this idea or, or this was my ideal to begin with, even if it is a property they own. I think. Yeah, like if you send an unsolicited script to a studio, they're most likely not going to read it because the idea is if they were to read the script and then anything they have in production currently has any similarities, then they would like, they could be sued for yeah. it. And that's why they, you know, a lot of those film contests um, will have rules that say, you know, if you submit a script to us as part of this contest, we will in good faith negotiate with you if you want to produce this or take the production further. If any of our productions bear similarities, it was incidental and not on purpose, and you cannot sue us. You can go to mediation and blah, blah, blah. So there's all these things that even film contests where they want you to submit scripts, yeah. they build in language that says any ideas will not be stolen. If we want to produce it, we'll reach out to you. If it bears similarities to anything else, it's coincidental. Yeah. Because, you know, as we've seen with our projects, there's been stuff that we made and then see something else is very similar that we had no idea about, never heard about. And it's just because there's only so many ideas, but it's the execution and a lot of different things that differentiate it. 
because like was it years ago the prestige and the illusionist came out in the same yeah. year um the day after tomorrow no not there um no it was armageddon, armageddon. and deep impact yeah um and dante's peak wasn't wasn't there another <laughs> volcano one oh uh i think so yeah. um but there's a lot of times you'll have like a couple of similar movies come out in the same period of time and there's just a lot of i mean some of that is the studio gets an inkling of oh they're making this let's yeah. beat them to the punch but then on the independent scale you know scene there are times when somebody says um like on our short film hazard there was some other one that had a mask that was similar and a character that was dressed similar I had never even heard of the movie because it was like another independent movie. And it just so happened there were some similar elements. Um, so there's just stuff like that that happens just mm-hmm. because people have similar ideas and it's just the execution, the end product are different. But that's why studios are very weary of these creepypastas because they need to be able to look back to a specific person to get the rights from where they can pay one person and have their bases covered. But if they start using elements that showed up in later fan fiction stuff, then they might get sued by the people saying, oh, you're stealing my story element. So that's why a lot of that gets kind of muddled up mm-hmm. and why it takes a while for those to happen, maybe. Um, but then again, I think and, and maybe sometimes some of that stuff is just better just to live as, you know, yeah, or just urban legend, Internet urban legends or whatever. Yeah, because like the know? Slender Man stuff, like because like on Reddit, there's a so there's all the subreddits where essentially just like um, there's the overall if you never use Reddit, it's a site where people submit content and people can vote it up or down or comment on it. And subreddits are where it kind of communities that are just for specific types of stories. So there's like a horror subreddit that's just horror movie stuff and things like that. There's ones for pretty much anything any you category think of. video games there's one you're into feet there's probably yeah. a slash feet foot one. fetish <laughs> there's ones that are just devoted to games like Fortnite yeah. or whatever um and then there's one that's no sleep is where people submit stories that are scary stories told as if they're true and then the rules are everyone goes along with it as if it is true so a lot of stuff gets submitted there that would be interesting to be made into movies but i think that the rights issues like you have yeah. to reach out to the person get the rights from them, verify that they're not just taking something else, mm-hmm. and then you're going to get sued by someone they plagiarized. So there's all these things around. But I think like when I first had heard about Slenderman years ago, I'd seen stuff about like on No Sleep, and then it's just like not realizing what that subreddit was at first. Like, oh, this is all, it could be true stories, but they're mostly fictional stories told as if they're true, and then the rules are everyone goes along. So then it took me a while. I was like, okay, trying to research what all this Slender Man stuff was. And it's like, oh, okay. It came out of some like forum where they were wanting stories to be treated as they're true and passed around. So movies about 10 years, or not 10 years. It's like five years too late. Cause I think yeah. that's when that was like kind of the peak of all that. But that's probably why they had to nail down enough story elements that they could get the rights to it and not have to worry about yeah. lawsuits. Like, but again, if you're, if you're a, I don't know how old you were maybe at the time, but you know, if you are a teenager who, has spent the last couple of years reading that stuff at night and creeping yourself out, yeah. building it up in your mind. Then you maybe you can fill in some gaps in the film. You know what I mean? I'm just saying like, the film's be, gonna be fall. More on, be more on edge and stuff. And, I've, I, just based on what the film looks like, if it looks like it's gonna follow a pretty well laid template for those types of movies. Yeah. Um, but let's see other news. I know that um, uh, Goblin's gonna be providing a live score for Suspiria screenings throughout the U.S. later this year. Yeah, I was looking into that. That Halloween night, it's in Atlanta, but because I was like, "Ooh, Atlanta, that's not yeah. too bad." But then it's like my daughter's, f- not her first Halloween, but you know, she was only like a month old last year, so I don't really want to skip out on Halloween with yeah. her. But even though we probably won't do much, but there's one in Chicago that's yeah, that's not Chi- too far from us. Yeah, in Chicago they have one on November 18th. Yeah. Um. So that'd be interesting to see, uh, to see Goblin do that. And then, um, oh, unrelated. So John Carpenter is doing another tour and busy man. And I looked it up. I was like, ah, oh, cause I wanted to go to the last one. I just yeah. didn't get a chance to. I looked it up. The only U S date on the schedule, cause it's mostly in European dates. The only U S date is Halloween night in uh, California. Mm. And it's like uh, LA. That'd be so, that'd be an expensive flight, expensive to stay there to watch that like i wish he, if he's coming to chicago or somewhere i'll probably yeah. go um when we went when uh, this is also unrelated but when we uh my wife and i got married you know we went to la decided to go there for a honeymoon just because we hadn't 
I had been there once before. She had never been there. It's like, oh, we'll do like a beach thing later on. We yeah. kind of just went to like, we like going to cities and, and seeing stuff sometimes. But uh, Halloween night, we went to LACMA, which is their, you know, big art museum. Yeah. And uh, Elvis Mitchell, the, f- the film critic and stuff, he was hosting. And I don't know if, I think he, I don't know if he curated it, but there was a Stanley Kubrick um show there and it was yeah. like all kinds of stanley kubrick props his his vintage all of his lenses and stuff like it was incredible it was like a costume show it was so awesome uh they have like the big halloween parade there too every yeah. year and we were like ah we'll skip the halloween parade that happens every year you know how you can yeah. see stanley uh, it was the opening night of the exhibit too like it opened like at midnight on yeah. halloween uh and that was like super super killer but yeah uh, Louisville doesn't get as much cool stuff as, as LA on Halloween night. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they they don't have that much stuff out here. Yeah, um, Nightmare try, Forest, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you have some some haunted houses and like a Halloween parade in October. Uh, I it's, think it's not too bad though. You know, yeah. we we've got some fun stuff. Yeah, and then there's a few other pieces of news like the trailer for um, Puppet Master: The Littlest Reich is out, uh, and that has Thomas Lennon in it, who's in Reno 911, and it's somebody that even if you don't remember what his name is, you've seen him in a crap ton mm-hmm. of comedies over the years because he's been like an I Love You Man and a bunch of movies from like that general group of people. Um, and then also has Barbara Crampton in it and then like some newer comedians and things like that. I mean, it looks like it's pretty low budget because um, I think it's being released under a label that Fangoria owns now. Um, oh, yeah. The, I saw the new owner of Fangoria. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it looks interesting. The Puppet Master series is never one that I've been like a huge fan of. I always like the box art. Yeah, the box art as a kid always fascinated me. But yeah. the movies, from what I remember, were mostly like 75% set up and then only maybe 25% puppets. Um, cause a lot of it's just, you know, like character drama, at least the first one. I haven't watched all of them. Maybe we should go and watch those at some point, but well, I just, that would be a good time before that new one comes out. And I just remember like, I think the movies puppet designs got more, uh, people like would send, I think they, I was watching something. There's some, one of those horror shows or channels had something about puppet master and it showed like the creator or the director or whatever saying, you know, they got a lot of unsolicited submissions for puppet designs like over the years hmm. and people like are really interested in that element of it. So it has like this, I think with a lot of kids too, because there really wasn't that much in them that was that objectionable. Yeah. Um, so they were pretty easy to be like a TV edit. And I think kids liked the puppets and things like that. So, cause they, you know, some of them were kind of quote unquote cute. Some of them were, you know, even if they were supposed to be scary, it's a puppet. So it's not, <laughs> it's not really inducing dreams or nightmares but I guess it could in the same way that Child's Play did if people had the My Buddy doll and then be just terrorized that it's going to come come to life and attack you. But, yeah, the trailer is out for that. That looks interesting. We'll probably check that out when it when it comes out. Um, there's some other minor news, like Frank Miller got the rights back to Sin City, which I wasn't a big fan of the second Sin City. So And the first one... I don't know how well it ages. Like, it was very fun and cool at the time seeing it in theaters when it was brand new. I was like, yeah. that was cool. And then I just never watched it again. Yeah. And if they were to make like a TV series out of it, like that visual aesthetic when it came out was cool. Yeah. And you had, you know, big A-listers. You had Bruce Willis and you had Clive Owen and you had Jessica Alba and you had these different A-list people in it when it came out. And it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. And it's like this super, you know, super stylistic noir type story and super style you know super super stylistic I mean, what year was that 2005 or something yeah like, it was like when i was a freshman I mean, or sophomore yeah. in college because i remember seeing it with different people lived in the dorm so you know they came out in that era and it was kind of a unique take to do that type of visual aesthetic with the types of actors they had which they're able to pull off because you know it's robert rodriguez and you know his connections all these big stars and was it Tarantino even like directed a sequence in it, yeah, like the uncredited? Um, so there's all this stuff in there that made it very stylistic and cool. And they waited like 10 years to make a sequel and then recast the Clive Owen character with Josh Brolin and had George, uh, Joseph Gordon Levin in it and some other people. And it just did not, it didn't have the same impact, it didn't work the same way. Um, I think just the time had passed. Like if the sequel came out a year or two after the first mm-hmm. one, people would have loved it. Um, because back when those movies came out, I may have listed as one of my favorite movies in like 2005 or whenever. Yeah, it was very memorable too. But then like you get a few years out from it, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe not so much. Um, because like the visual aesthetic was cool at the time, and it's still cool to watch it. 
Um, I just don't know that that works for multiple iterations of mm-hmm. that. Um, cause like another movie I remember that had a really stylistic look was a scanner darkly. Do you remember that mm-hmm. one? Yeah. The Keanu Reeves link later movie. I haven't rewatched it. It's all the rotoscoped stuff yeah. where it's, they actually shot the movie and then painted over the images, like I guess frame by frame or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think it's film waking life. Maybe did like a rudimentary version of that. Yeah. Maybe in the nineties and then that Van Gogh. Well, that's not rotoscope, but they've been, yeah, I think it was. I think the Van Gogh movie. Yeah, I think they shot that, and then they had painters paint every scene, which and then, is a cool thing to do. Yeah, the visuals. And I remember there um, too. There was the video game Thirteen that was voiced by David Duchovny. Mm-hmm. It was like X I I I, um, where it was a rotoscope game where they or like the cell shaded mm-hmm. kind of you know normal game Im- in- engine, but instead of being like semi realistic polygons trying to mimic reality, they did that same look yeah. of just kind of the um cell shaded look. So a lot of that stylistic stuff doesn't necessarily hold up over time when you kind of look at because the it, you know it being so unique at the time, you know in and of itself makes it appealing. But then once the newness of that wears off and you watch it in a vacuum. You're like, so how good is this? I well, think- I think I think at one time through it's good. For me, it's like Sin City. Yeah, it was mimicking the graphic novels and the comic books and stuff. But yeah. I almost feel like even though it would break it for that sequel, they should have devised a new visual style, yeah. you know, or a color palette or something like, you know what I mean? Make it distinctly look different to yeah. be exciting again, not like a 15 year old technique or 10 year old technique at the time or whatever. Yeah, that's that's kind of the problem. One well, too, like the original one, like the Bruce Willis story worked really well. Um, like on its own Mm -hmm. just because, you know, very traditional story. Um, the Mickey Rourke sequence, it was just cool to see him do what he did and that worked, but kind of revisiting all this stuff out of sequence uh, later. what's his name? Frodo. Oh, Elijah Wood. Yeah, Elijah Wood's segment. Was it? Yeah. That was him, right? That That wasn't Daniel Radcliffe, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. That was, well, that was during the Harry Potter. Yeah, that's right. Daniel Radcliffe was still a kid, so. (laughs) Yeah, so there's there's some that, that shocked people though him like eating somebody's <laughs> ear or face or whatever he did in that in that sequence, um, and then like I guess like one like something that was kind of funny was recently Jamie Lee Curtis when she was being interviewed I think after Comic Con about um, Halloween somebody said um, like do people still put on hockey masks and try to scare you <laughs> and it just showed her like reaction was just like what the. <laughs> And then oh, that's become man. like a big meme. That they, guy, poor, that poor guy. And then that guy tried to play it off like he was like, that was what he meant. But, oh. you know, something that I have learned over the years is doing the, like some of the videos we've done, you get a single fact wrong and you will be told about it. Yeah. And that was just such a very facepalm moment. Like, did you not even watch the trailer for the movie she's in? <laughs> did you not even look <laughs> at the sure, poster I'm for sure the not. movie? You know, especially when it's something like Comic-Con, yeah. you know what I mean? Like. They're probably just getting people rent in and they're like, okay, Jamie Lee Curtis, she's in Halloween. They probably told the guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. They may have had it booked ahead of time, but it may have just been like, he might be like, okay, great. Uh, they hand him questions. You know, I don't know for sure, but like when I would do like celebrity stuff for like the Derby when that comes in town, you know, yeah. you know, everybody walked the red carpet and then it's all of a sudden like people would have to walk in front of them and hold up signs about like who this is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because some of the celebrities were like, I don't know who this is. Some people may know who they are. It's like, oh, it's a top chef person. Yeah, a top chef or, show uh, you know, bachelor, the bachelor or whatever. But then like Miguel Ferrer came by and I was yeah. like, oh, I want to ask him about Twin Peaks season three. <laughs> that was before that. And then um, I can't remember her name, but she was in the last season of Community. Like I talked to her for a second and was like, I loved you in Community. She is, she comes in. I didn't watch all yeah, the last season. Yeah, it, I, it's the, it's the, she's like a administrator on some level. Yeah. Uh, but she was great and very funny. She's in a ton of other stuff that yeah. I can't, I'm slipping on her name, but I talked to her about community stuff. I was like, you were awesome in that because she really was. But yeah, a lot of times it's just like, if I'm not a fan of the specific thing, I don't yeah. know what this is. So, yeah. you know, he could have just been like, he maybe not a horror guy at all. He might be scared but of I film. guess that shows you what a lot of general people's ideas, a lot of the franchises yeah. are. It's all kind of it's like, oh, is that the guy with the, the hockey mask? It shows and the, claw the most hand? iconic <laughs> thing is Jason. Like, as much as you might, might like Michael and everything, I think the hockey mask probably does it. Well, because people aren't going to be like, oh, the modified William Shatner mask. Yeah. Um, hockey mask yeah. is easier to. One too. Does like, William Shatner ever paint his face white and chase you around <laughs> Comic Con? <laughs> that would be an interesting look. And then something else too, just real quickly, like one of our videos from years ago has gotten a little bit of traction more recently. The the Corey did that video, like the top five movies that actually scared me. And something that was interesting to me that I saw in the comments was somebody said, you know, these old movies don't work anymore and they don't scare anybody who's that young. 
So movies that are older aren't going to work on the younger audience. It's more modern stuff that'll mm-hmm. scare them. And then some people said like, oh, you know, Exorcist isn't scary. Um, Serbian film or Martyrs is scary. It's like, well, I don't think those movies are quote unquote scary. I just think they have body dismembered stuff that people would find yeah. hard to watch. Nobody's actually walking out of that movie scared of like what's in the shadows. I don't think mm-hmm. because of those movies, it's not like somebody's, you know, getting their skin ripped off and raped or something. So those movies I don't think are scary. I think they're just shocking. Um, but the idea of old movies don't work for younger people. So somebody who's the current 17 year olds would not watch the exorcist or Rosemary's baby and come away being scared by it. Um, cause recently I was somewhere and somebody who was like 20 was talking about how they watched jaws and it just was terrible. And it's like, okay, I was just listening to what the discussion was. It's like, Oh, the characters are terrible. Not couldn't get into any of it and all this stuff. So I think that, who was this person? I don't want to reveal. <laughs> but I was just was like, it a relative of somebody? Yeah. Okay, I probably know who it is. But uh, I was just listening. I was like, oh, okay, so like I get that somebody who's 19 today doesn't connect with the character of Quint from Jaws. But I think that, you know, Brody is more of just like a family guy doing his job. Like, I think there'd be something there to connect to. But it's just like... It, it's, yeah, it's, it's well, funny it, seeing people talk about like we talk about things working or not working or general fans. Mm-hmm. A lot of people really only want to watch movies that have been made in the past 10 years. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. My, my friend, her uh, husband now, but at the time, you know, remember her telling me like probably five or six years ago, she's like, oh, yeah, he doesn't like to watch any older movies if they don't look brand new. He does not <laughs> like watching. And he was he's our age. You yeah, know what I mean? They're amazing age. to me. He's like, no, anything that looks a little bit older, because I was recommending some movies from like the 80s that yeah. were they weren't even low budget. You know, yeah. they were like or like 70s that are very good films. Yeah, they just aren't completely contemporary looking, even like, if they have aged well. Yeah. And she's like, he does not like to watch anything that is not new. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 the thing about being scary too, you know, people mentioning that is, you know, people always try to make scary movies, you know, yeah. actually scary movies. Some people do, some people don't chase that. And then they get chastised for like, Hey, this isn't scary. You know, yeah. like we don't really try to make stuff. That's like super, like, we're not like trying to think of like, what is the scariest thing possible? Yeah. You know, like that's not our well, ideas us, we're thinking about when you watch films. enough movies, very little actually scares you. Yeah. So then it's hard for you to really S- so, you know, something I was thinking about, you know, you you just brought that up is like, I wonder if, you know, the concept of a scary movie a lot of times is like generational, like the things that's going to be the most popular scary movie that's actually scary may not work on us. It may only work on 20 year olds yeah. because it has to work, be made right now, work in this spe- function in a specific way that's going to scare them in a specific way. Yeah. And then in 10 years. Nothing's going to scare them, but those films they grew up being scared at. You know what I mean? Like, is yeah, it going to work like that? Because, like, know. in the, you know, during Halloween when that was made, the, you know, babysitter murderer yeah. type urban legend of he's in the he's in the attic. The the calls coming from inside, like the idea of the kind of psycho killing people was scary to people. Mm-hmm. That was like an urban legend or, you know, because the original Halloween title was going to be the babysitter, the babysitter murderers or something like that. So you have like that was what was scary at the time was the like the psycho who kills people. And, you know, like the old story about like you could hear the sound, something on the roof of the car mm-hmm, yeah. it was toes where a psycho killer did that. And there's a hook. So there's all these like urban legends like that that worked for that era that would be like our parents when they were growing up. And then that was kind of through the 80s. And then it seems like kids who grew up, you know, in the 2000s and things like that, a lot of it was more supernatural creepypasta type stuff like slender man and things like that that were these supernatural characters or supernatural entities that were scary to people over in like real people weren't scary because once you saw 9 11 happen and you saw the towers come down and thousands of people die at the hands of humans then it's hard for an individual with a knife to be as scary because they're just killing people by the ones and you have mass shooters and you have terrorists you have all these things where it's people killing you know tens hundreds or thousands of people it's hard to be that scared of a guy in a mask with one knife um, or to make that be the fear inducing thing. So you have to have a supernatural threat that's uncontrollable, unstoppable and even more, you know, um, vicious than a terrorist. So I think that's just the, the goalpost shift on what scares people. And some people just have zero ability to watch a movie that doesn't cater to what their specific thoughts are. 
and watch it objectively just a movie and be you know find enjoyment in it if they just say oh this isn't scary this is garbage this is the stupidest thing ever i'm bored some people can't watch a movie just for the entertainment value of it it has to scare them and or if a film is made to just scare and it doesn't have anything else like good story or character and it fails at scaring yeah. then it's a complete miss you know yeah so it's just interesting to me to see what those thoughts are because mm-hmm. um, like on those comments in the video somebody also talked about you know well this this is just a list that any millennial could get making looking at imdb it's like well i mean this was something that like Corey came up with like on his own yeah. it wasn't like he went and looked at top five lists or something like that but it's just it's interesting to see to see what people's thoughts are on you know scary movies and what you know our parents would call scary movies a lot of i remember like when i was growing up i heard about how scary the exorcist was mm-hmm. In you know, like in our era, people would talk about the scary movies were, and it kind of depends on what era what they want. Blair Witch, Blair Witch was something that scared biggest, people. The biggest, you know, kind of shock to audiences. Well, because too, if didn't it, many things didn't touch. If you knew a lot of like, if you watched Blair Witch under the pretense it was an actual documentary that was actually footage that was recovered yeah. and found, it was scary as hell. Yeah. If you watch it just knowing it was a movie that they shot for a low budget and a marketing gimmick. I think the end was still very scary. Yeah, I mean, it was still like in a movie that, uh, you know, take out. It was very creepy watching it as like a 13-year-old or whatever. Well, because like my friends and I remember watching it. And then back then, the big thing we used to do was like pop, you know, um, put a tent out in the backyard. Mm Mm-hmm. And because like a huge like multi-person tent is like two or three of us out there and run like cables and everything and have like a TV and Nintendo 64 and snacks and stuff. And I think there's one time that everybody just got too creeped out and had to go back inside. Yeah. And so there's different things that work for different people. And it's just interesting seeing like, you know, now at this point, it's more, you know, possession, supernatural stories or what get, you know, younger audiences more so than individuals with a knife or something. So I just, you know, I just thought it was interesting watching the comments on that video come in. And some people who are probably more in our age range and demographic. Oh, yeah, good list. This is probably what mine would look like. And then, like, younger people just straight up saying, like, these movies don't work for anybody that's under the age of 30. These yeah. are garbage. So Which, just, I mean, everybody's opinions do. You know, if something scares you, it scares you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Like, yeah. I, I'm actually very interested in seeing what scares people. I wish we could figure out a way to do a poll of different demographics. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, every well, year. And just say, like, hey, what's your... What's what's been the scariest what's your film? Favorite scary what movie? haven't you seen? What have you seen? But what what has been your scariest but, film? But then like somebody had to make the comment like you know why does everyone say The Exorcist is scary? I laughed through the entire movie, and it's like I don't really know what you would laugh through the entire movie at. I mean, even when I've watched laughably bad horror movies, I usually or, don't laugh at them. Or you laugh like at the dialogue, not that it's bad because it's just so crazy and ridiculous. I did laugh out loud at Green Inferno because the acting performances and dialogue. Yeah. It's like are they. Because there was, uh, yeah, not to go back in that movie, there's one character that feels like it was a Fred Armisen impersonation from Saturday Night Live. Oh, or, no, like from <clears throat> Portlandia. Like, one yeah. Of the, yeah. He's like, do you want to go die in the woods? We will go kill oh, the tribe. Oh, I thought you meant the uh, her friend from the beginning. You know what I mean? Because they're very conscious of, oh. the, you know, vegeta- like over... No, I mean, liberal, so like the guy, left, yeah. so the guy that ran the overall group that was going on the trip, yeah. reminded me of a Fred Armisen impersonation of someone because he kind of reminded me of like um, when he did on Parks and Rec, yeah, like from Venezuela or whatever. It's, at the beginning of the film is almost like if a Portlandia skit shifted into horror, yeah. Only the comedy is not intentional, <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, going separate of that, um, you know, there's all that stuff, um, and then briefly before we get into Shutter Island, we can discuss things we watched. Um, I watched Death Spa, and that was from, like, 1990, had Ken Furry in it. Um, it was from that era, like, not too long after Chopping Mall of technology goes wild and mm-hmm. kills people. This one, there was more of a supernatural element, because there was actually, like, a ghostly force manipulating technology. But it's just funny to look back in, like, 1990 or probably, like, 89 when they shot it and just think of what people's ideas of technology were back then. And there was a bunch of, like, blinking, flashing lights on the wall and computer screens and stuff. And to see what they thought like an automated gym would be in that era. <laughs> and then like they had the spa name just so that when parts of the lights went out, it said like on the sign on the marquee, when parts of the lights went out, it would say death spa. That's pretty cool. I so, like that. Like you give it a name. that's kind of nonsensical yeah. just so it can do that. Yeah. That's worth it. I think like overall, the movie had some like decent kills in it. Um, but nothing in it that really grabbed my attention. And you know, I was just, once again, I was only half watching it because I was doing something else. But I kept there's like three lead characters that are like white dudes that all have similar hairstyles and builds and height. And I just 
had trouble telling who was who. Um, then like Ken Furry is in it and he doesn't do a ton, but he's kind of in there and there's just some wacky stuff. Like to me, it's not a movie that's so bad. It's good that you have to watch. Um, to me, it is not really as fun as chomping mall. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're into like late eighties, early nineties, when they kind of realize that just a dude in a mask doesn't work anymore. So you need some supernatural element. It's more in line with that thinking of, you know, a Michael Myers knockoff or a Jason knockoff is not going to cut it these days. We need to do something different. So it was in that era when they were trying to do more high concept stuff. I just don't know that it really worked. And I was never really concerned for any of the characters well-being. And there's like these subplots that there's really not enough characterization there. And like I said, the fact that I had trouble remembering, like, well, who's the lawyer and who's the guy? Yeah, that happens a lot in some of those films. So it's one of those movies. It was on Amazon Prime, so you can watch it for free. Um, like, it's not the worst movie. Um, like, tonally, it kind of reminded me more of um, Prom Night 2, Hello, Mary Lou, or whatever. So it's more yeah. in line with that. I think that Prom Night 2 is probably more enjoyable because there was more stuff in it. But um, it's just one of those kind of movies you don't hear a ton about, but you see the cover for it. And I remember seeing that in video stores cause it has like the girl and the exercise clothes with the skull face. So interesting cover. Um, the movie itself, you know, it's, if you're, if you were in the, the mood for a kitschy early nineties, late eighties, um, horror movie, that's not a supernatural slasher, but it has like, or not as just a straight slasher, but it has mm -hmm. like supernatural elements. It's out there. Um, but if you want like technology based stuff, I still think like chopping mall is probably more fun. Um, I don't really have a chance to watch much else cause I was just busy the past yeah. few weeks. I hope that chopping mall movie turns out well, even though it's going to be supernatural. Even best. if they do make it, I'm not, I'm not confident that'll definitely happen. I mean, either that's what yeah, I'm, I'm interested though. So, um, I watched some typical stuff I've seen a million times or before I watched a little bit of body double, Brian De Palma's body double again. Um, I watched, uh, Castle Rock, which is the Stephen King, Stephen King's yeah, Castle the Hulu Rock. series based on the fictional town he set stories in, but I think original stories set in and around the locations that he had included in his book. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think there, as of this recording, there's two episodes out. I'll only watched one episode only because it was so late last night. Um, but after watching the first episode, we were kind of both ready to jump right into that second one. Yeah. So, um, and I'm easy to fall off a TV show. You know yeah. what I mean? If I'm not into it, I'm like, I'm not going to spend this much time. Also, I didn't realize that, you know, it comes out every Wednesday. Yeah. It's not, they didn't put it all. They didn't do well, the net. You know, Hulu doesn't follow the Netflix yeah, model. I, I forget about once. that. Every time I watch something on a Hulu, I'm like, wait, what? Uh, but it's yeah. kind of nice. It's a double edged sword yeah. of, it makes you have a little bit of time to think between episodes yeah. and to discuss it versus having it all dropped in your lap where you watch it in one weekend and then kind of forget. Yeah. I'm sure they've got to spread it out cause they're not dropping as much stuff as Netflix as well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it helps you subscribe to the service for longer. <laughs> and too, like, I do wonder like if you have week to week releases, if you have big cliffhangers between episodes and things like that, that does build a conversation mm -hmm. around it as opposed to if you drop them all at once. There's like so the show Legion that I really like this season like ended kind of controversially and it's coming back for a new a third season but like if you had dropped all those episodes at the same time I think people would have had less problems with some of the episodes they saw as just having filler and not as plot much plot yeah. movement but that final moment would have all just been part of one contained story and I think that it would have gotten a lot less discussion because it would just got dropped all at once mm -hmm. so there's so much to discuss up front. Um, versus a week to week release gives you more time to really focus in on what happens in the episodes and talk about well, it. Well, I think it's very smart with this series because there there's a lot of storylines going on at once, or I don't know at once, but um, I don't know if they're converging. You know, yeah. like you, we've we've this episode introduces you to a few different characters where you think they could have their own little storyline going because yeah. we've spent you spent a little bit of time with them. They're not just popping in and out. Um, they may just serve as a function, a catalyst to get certain characters together or st certain storylines to converge. But yeah. it seems like um, everybody, uh, there's going to be maybe a lot of characters in this, which it seems cool. It seems like a small town, you know, like something like Twin Peaks where it's like, okay, we're going to start this town. You're going to start getting introduced to all these characters. Yeah. Um, um, and also too, because there are so many, um, Stephen King references. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think that also will benefit the show being put out once a week because people can say, Oh, did you notice this? this yeah. You know, um, I'm not like, I've, unfortunately I did not get into reading Stephen King when I was younger. So I just yeah. never, you know, like I watched all the movies, but I didn't have good reading habits. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so, but I was, you know, just seeing even, even after the episode, you can watch the, uh, I guess creators talk about it, not Stephen King, but two of the showrunners, I assume. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're pointing out some of the references. I've seen, yeah, I've seen people online point out some stuff. I've seen somebody point out something that was like an inaccurate reference or something. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, Hey, they, they reference this as being this, but actually in the books, it's this. Well, actually. Yes. Yeah. uh, Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm. I'm enjoying it tonally. I I like it. Um, it's not you know. It's not. I'm trying to think. I mean, it feels Stephen Kingish. That's what's cool yeah. about it too. You know, um, it feels Stephen Kingish, and it doesn't. It's not slow. It's you know, some Stephen King movies are. You feel like they're kind of filler sometimes. You know, yeah, I know Cujo. Who, who, I just you know, Cujo is one that I think like okay, yeah, this feels like it was stretched a little bit. So going back to our earlier discussion about what works in the time, I yeah. think there's a lot of people who talk about Cujo being so scary because at the time they were used to stories about you know Lassie and yeah. all these things. But when you see a movie that turns that on its head, then it's very effective for them. Us watching it in the present, like it's not a very thrilling movie. Yeah, well, especially the parts not dealing with Cujo in the car. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's it's fine. It's just, it, but it feels like it's just there to give you a story yeah when you're that's not why you're there you're there to see the dog yeah and and that's fine if you're there to see the dog and it turns out there's this really compelling storyline but it was just fine it's like what if uh old yeller was a horror film yeah so this feels like i'm interested in all these characters you know what i mean i'm interested in all these characters and i'm interested to see where this goes so uh, i'm very hopeful for this series um this could hopefully do well for them but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on board with it for sure. Um, enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, then I watched some of the mission Impossibles, you know, um, because I was excited for fallout. So that was probably my most anticipated summer movie. Yeah. I know it was fallout. Like as soon as the trailer comes on first time in theaters this year, when I saw it, I was yeah. just like <laughs> jacked up already. Um, uh, I think rogue, um, uh, rogue I'm, nation, rogue nation. I was about to say, rogue squad for some reason rogue squadron yeah squadron <laughs> uh rogue nation i that's my favorite i need to go back and watch the first one again um because the brian de palma one the original mission Impossible for 96 it's slow it's, but it's, it's, it's um a film. at the time like the big action set pieces so the most iconic imagery is him hanging over the floor on the cables mm-hmm. in the computer room and then we're like the the aquarium scene and there was like the train stuff with the helicopter yeah. that the CGI doesn't necessarily yeah. hold up. But I mean, I think it holds up better than Mission Impossible 2. Yes. Where it's got the Limp Biscuit song and him jumping off motorcycles and kicking people midair yeah. and doves everywhere. And uh, the Mission Impossible 3 is kind of like a re- reboot of the franchise. Yeah, I like 3. When I saw it in theaters, I was like, all right, awesome. Let's do this. You know, because I thought I didn't know if it was going to bit back. more. I think it had been like six years or something. Yeah. And then Ghost Protocol... Um, came in Brad Bird. and the Brad Bird went and kind of, you know, elevated it back up to like a little bit more high concept. And then with the last two, it's just like, oh, let's have amazing action and like practical yeah, effects I mean, and Tom yeah. Cruise doing stuff. Ghost Protocol is phenomenal. You know, there's some people like a, they prefer the Brad Bird one versus um, Chris McQuarrie's. But they've all been good. But yeah, like, and Since that's, that's why back. it's so awesome is because, yeah, they're, they're so good. You know what I mean? And such like, inventive yeah. visuals. Yeah. I, I prefer Rogue Nation the best. Like, again, I need to watch the first one, but I think pretty sure Rogue Nation is going to hold up as being my favorite. Yeah. Uh, you know, prior to this Fallout one, uh, it's just more my flavor. Like, I, Chris McQuarrie, like his action set pieces and stuff, uh, I just think he's like phenomenal at him. Um, and this one, like, I don't know which one I like most, but, uh, you know, seeing Fallout, uh, I'll have to watch Fallout again just because yeah. I love Rogue Nation so much. And I've also, I've, Minor spoilers for Rogue Nation, if you haven't seen it yet, but very minor spoilers. But the thing in the theaters, they always kept building up the airplane stunt. Yeah. And that got you more jacked for it because you, you saw the behind the scenes. And you saw, like, oh, he's Tom on Cruise the plane. Dangling off an airplane. Yeah. Um, they didn't do that as much for this one. And I wish they would have because it's, I saw somebody talking about this. It's almost like reverse Uncanny Valley where you're used to things being so fake. Yeah. That even though it's real, you almost can't believe it. You're like, so what? I want to watch a lot of the behind the scenes on this. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, to see what was they real. They should have showed more of that for this. Uh, but for uh, Rogue Nation, you know, they just going to the movies like every, almost every week last summer or, or whenever it came out. It's like you saw that over and over and I never got tired of watching it. And then the movie came out. And I thought, OK, that's going to be obviously like the big set piece. And it was in the beginning. Yeah. The and movie. it was in the beginning, which I loved. I'm like, OK, great. That's it reminds me of um, I think some critics 
uh, maybe like, I don't know if they, they thought of this or if they, or if this is actually a true function of what Kubrick was doing, but like whenever they were doing eyes wide shut, you know, it was supposed to be the sexiest film of all time. Nicole yeah. Kidman, you were going to see her naked. You know, it was like a big thing. And the opening scene, the first shot is her naked. Yeah. And people were saying, well, this is Kubrick saying, I'm getting this out of the way. Yeah. You know, I'm going to give you, give you that at first so you can enjoy the story and not just be waiting for that. And I almost feel like that had that same feeling yeah. where we got the airplane thing out of the way. So you're not waiting for that to happen in the film. And it yeah. was smart because it didn't make you want the film to hurry up and get, get to that point. Yeah. It was so smart, I think. Um, and maybe that's why they didn't do it with this. Maybe they didn't want to say like, Hey, um, we don't want to show one of the final set pieces because you might just be waiting for it for the whole time. Yeah. Um, but, but I think this film's a little bit different flavor than Rogue Nation, but at the same time, it feels very much the same part of it. Like this first time a director has followed up a Mission Impossible It made film. it more of like a sequel to the yes. events of the prior film. Absolutely a sequel. Um, so, you know, try to watch that film if you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> it's not like you have to rewatch it right away because, you know, they fill you in on stuff. Yeah. But it's just a little bit more satisfying. And and honestly, even watching some of the other older ones, like, even you know... Um, would, would benefit you some as well. But, uh, I just think it is, I thought it was awesome. Absolutely loved it. You know, I'm trying to think what's some other like great films this year. I'm trying to think. So throughout the course of the year, so you have like the superhero stuff like black Panther and yeah. infinity war. If you take those out, and you're talking about theatrical releases. Oh, what have we talked about this year? That, it's like Phantom Thread. That technically came out last year. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I love that film. I've been rewatching that. But this is, I think, my favorite film of the year, you know, of 2018. Um, because nothing else that I can think of matches it. Uh, there'll probably be some great stuff in the fall. But as a pure... It, Chris McQuarrie, you know, like him and Tom Cruise, I think it's a massively co- collaborative effort these films because Tom Cruise is a producer. He's yeah. been on it since the beginning. It's I think it was the first series he ever produced. Yeah. So this was kind of his baby from the beginning. Um, but with like Rogue Nation even, that was the first Mission Impossible they worked on together. They had done Edge of Tomorrow or Lived Out Repeat together. But Rogue Nation, after that amazing opera scene, they were talking about, oh, what's going to happen now? He's like, oh, well, then he's going to leave the opera house. And he's like, well, how? He's like, oh, he's going to go out the back door or something. And Tom Cruise is says like no he's not going to go out the back door this is mission impossible he's like what do you want to do he's like i don't know we'll go off the roof you know yeah. and just like that whole thought process made me realize okay like i love where tom cruise's headspace is with this series yeah and chris mccquarrie he knows where it's at you know what i mean and it's just them two collaborating again and just you know just melding so well and just elevating this series i think um this is a different flavor i Opera House is probably my still my favorite set piece. Um, and then the airplane, maybe because I know so much of what went behind that yeah. and everything is like the biggest, most impressive thing. I'd like, you know, just a single like impressive thing, I think, between the two films and really, you know, between all of all of Mission Impossible's. But having said that, there's amazing sequences in this and they're just a different flavor. It's yeah. like having a different dish. Um, but I cannot wait to watch this again. And this end up could be my favorite one. I don't know yet. Like I couldn't say, but I don't even care about picking a favorite. That's how much, you know, because they're all, you know, I'm not accepting kind of Mission Impossible too. They're all good movies. Well, I mean, between this and Rogue Nation. Yeah. Between like, yeah, but I would say Ghost Protocol is phenomenal. Yeah, Ghost Protocol on. They're all great. Yeah. I haven't seen the new one yet. I want to see it. Um, this weekend I was just busy and then movie passes shutting down and then it opened back up, but then you can't see Mission Impossible with it. So I'll see it maybe this week. Yeah. Um, um, I don't want to get, I don't want things to get spoiled inadvertently. No, but, but yeah, I mean, I just, uh, yeah, I, I really loved it. I cannot wait to watch this again and again. Um, and it's, yeah, it doesn't need to do, I don't think it needed like a plain thing like that to just top that and negate, you yeah. know, Rogue Nation. Like they're not just trying to do the same thing again and like, yeah. oh, let's do it a little bit better differently because that gets boring. They're doing different things kind of. Um, well, but- I think too, like you, you show like people have seen the prior ones and enjoyed them. And it's like, okay, the new one, you know, there's some cool stunts in it. It's got Henry Cavill, who mm-hmm. is Superman. So bringing in another big star and we tease enough in the trailer to sh- get you interested. Let's not spoil everything. Yes, and for I sure. prefer that. Yeah, for sure. Because um, I may not be the average movie going public. I don't like watching full trailers because they always show third act stuff. Yeah. I heard some people say too, like, hey, and I noticed it too. They're like, hey, you lied in the trailers. And yeah. he's like, ha. You know, like there's a little bit of misdirection. Yeah. Which 
again, Chris McCory, I think smartly did it, you know, misdirection with that, with that last one, with the airplane stunt yeah. and everything, just on your assumptions of knowing action films and yeah. they put the craziest stuff at the end typically. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, like even just the running sequences in this film are f- phenomenal. Like I just like watching Tom Cruise run. The more and, he runs in a movie, the better they are. Exactly. And, t- <laughs> and like, there's like some long, just running sequences and Chris McCrory, the way he shoots them, like they're exciting and fun and funny because he puts beats in things. It's yeah. not just shots of people's feet and the cut trying to make it exciting. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he doesn't need to do shaky cam with, uh, a bunch of cuts to make you feel like, Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. No, he makes it exciting based on the dramatic beats within the action. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the looks characters gives maybe a problem they'll have quickly, some dialogue exchanges. Um, it's just like Chris McQuarrie, like he's got this down well, from and our, Tom Cruise knows what he wants. And it's just like a perfect blend Well, from our own projects, uh, sh- shooting a running sequence isn't as easy as it would seem, or you would think at first glance, because somebody running at pretty close to full speed or as fast as they can safely run in, a, in an environment doesn't look cinematic at all. Doesn't look they're running yeah. fast. So you have to, yeah. you know, angle and, and, you know, place edits and do things to make it look exciting because people get really turned off if they don't think the person is running their absolute fastest and through something. And it's hard to make it look Also, that Derek's way. not Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of that was me from Hazard. Yeah. Which, you know, there, I saw somebody pick out a shot. I think it was in the trailer. Basically, it's just like him running from underneath a bridge, you yeah. know, across the little, um, across the water, uh, you know, next to a, a river or whatever. Yeah. Um, and somebody said, Hey, this is my favorite, like running shot of the film. It's just a quick shot. You know, yeah. this is like people who are interested in cinema. It's yeah. not just, it's just like one little shot. And he was like, any tricks, you know? And he's like, Oh, you know, just, this is the first running shot I planned, but, uh, Tom Cruise is just, you know, a beast or whatever. And he's like, also too, he had a broken ankle when he was running along yeah. this thing too. And he's just like hauling ass, yeah. you know? Um, so the fact that he just puts everything into it and just knowing everybody's putting so much into these films yeah. makes it exciting because they're all excited to make them. Well, it's not just, Hey, I got hired to shoot this action film from this script. This guy, I don't know. Yeah. And now we're just going to hire an actor who doesn't really, who's only excited about being in it because he's going to be on screen. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's not just this thing put together. It feels like almost an independent film in some regards where everybody's doing it out of passion yeah. and like complete love for it. And the passion, but also the it's like the most talented people working, yeah. you know, and that's just like why I love that series. So yeah, go see that movie. Yeah. So that wrap up, uh, what you want? Yeah. That, yeah. That's as much as I'll say about it. I don't want to spoil right. anything. All right. So now moving to our discussion of shutter Island, the 2010 movie from Martin Scorsese scoring, uh, not scoring, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo, Ben Kingsley, Max Van Sydow, Michelle Williams, Patricia Clarkson, Jackie Earl Haley, uh, and then you have great um, kind of character actors in it. Ted Levine, John Carroll Lynch, Elias Coteus. Um, so just a lot Casey of... Casey Jones. Yeah, that's which, what I was thinking. Casey Jones. Three from, people from... Uh, three or four people from uh, Zodiac. Eli- Elias. Um, Coteus. Coteus. And then... Uh, John Carroll Lynch. Yeah, and uh, Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, so yeah. a mini yeah, reunion Yeah, and there was that. something else, too, that I was like, man, there's another film, too, where there's like three people, and I can't remember what it was. I don't know if I wrote it down. Not that it's important, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, and then you have Max Van Sydow uh, introducing some pathos to it and uh, playing his role well. So we will... I guess we'll include spoilers throughout because the movie's on yeah. Amazon Prime. Um, I would assume most people who watch this podcast probably watched it when it came out because it's Scorsese doing a genre film that's not crime noir or you know his kind of usual fare. You know, it's not Raging Bull or Taxi Driver. It's um, you know the basic premise is U.S. Marshals go to a prison, you know, or not a prison, well, kind of like a mental health prison island. To investigate the miss, um, <clears throat> the disappearance of one of the um, inmates. So they go there and do that. And while they're there, they encounter different things. And it's a mental hospital where Ben Kingsley is trying different techniques with mental health care because it's back, you know, post World War II. So back in kind of that noirish era, I um, mean, you know, like the fifties, you know, era. I don't remember exactly what the time frame is. Yeah, it's po- yeah, post World War II. It very much seems like this is like Scorsese. Like, hey, I liked films from this era because yeah. I was a kid watching them. You know what I mean? And um, and then you didn't have, write this, but yeah. And then you have you know flashbacks to Leo DiCaprio in World War II, 
and you have you know different things Which, that has Scorsese in. I'm watching this has Scorsese done a World War II movie before um trying to remember I don't think he has you know I don't think he's really touched the Holocaust or anything from what I remember you know so I just was like oh this is interesting like basically you get a glimpse I mean it's, it is part World War II movie I guess in some regards you know very limited scenes but um yeah, I don't know if he's done a yeah, straight you know, up World this War II kind of project. His first, I guess dabble in it, or probably only, or more explicitly showing scenes set during the war, not yes, just that's things. What, yes, um, that are after the fact. So you know, you have the elements of you know detectives, kind of you know, kind of classic gumshoe detectives going to this island and looking into it, and then his character, Leo's character. Um, Teddy Daniels has like these conspiracy theories about stuff that's going on at the island and the fact that the person, like I said, full spoilers, the person that killed his family and set a fire in their apartment got sent there and disappeared. So there's all these conspiracy angles they're going with that kind of be classic crime noir. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have, you know, I wouldn't say like horror movie imagery so much as you have some scary imagery or I mean, there's some horror movie, basically just the blood on, um, oh my God, I can't think of her name. She's from 30, she's in a million stuff, but she's in 30 Rock, Hollow Bones, the lady that supposedly um, killed her her kids. There's dead children around and she's got blood like dripping down her face. Yeah. That's very much, that was like, that's like the most horror imagery. That's like straight out of The Shining almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not, not literally, but it seems like something that would fit in with the, that sort of uh, feel of a horror film. And then you have Ted Levine who's in there and he's great um, as the warden. And you have John Carroll Lynch who, you know, is a perfect actor for a lot of these movies. Yeah. Because going back to Face Off, he was really good in that. He's one of the guards. Mm-hmm. Then um zodiac he was perfect um in that movie and in this movie he's good too just kind of whenever you see him show up you know what you're getting and it's but it's funny because my earliest you know drew carey show was drew carey show uh, and then fargo you know what i mean when he's like the sweet husband that's making uh uh, Francis McNormie uh, breakfast. You yeah, know what I mean? So like, it's hey, he's either Drew yeah. Carey's cross-dressing brother who's going to be married to Mimi. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, Fargo. And then, like, he later would be in other movies that would, you know, kind of change what his yeah, perception he's was. And, like, at this point, though, when you see him show up in movies, you know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's usually, like, when you see him, you're like, oh, okay, shit, this is going to get in gear now. This is going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just the movie, him being a minor character shows, you know, like, they had Leo DiCaprio in it, who's doing a great job, and Mark Ruffalo, who, you know, similar to Zodiac, was a detective in this mm-hmm. one. Um, and Ben Kingsley being in it and, and doing ben a great Kingsley, job. Ben Kingsley, I think, is phenomenal. Like, I, he's one of my favorite actors. Just something, yeah. I don't know, I just, I and think when, he's so, so good and just so enthralling. There was... Some movie I think we just happened to turn on, my wife and I, years ago, and it seemed fairly low budget. Maybe it wasn't, but it just seemed like a minor film. I'd never even heard of it, but Ben Kingsley played, I think, some sort of magician. Yeah. And we basically watched the whole film because of him. And that was, I think, maybe the first thing I'd ever saw him in. I was like, oh, yeah. I love him. And then started seeing him in Iron Man 3, and then realized, wait, I have seen him in more stuff than this. Like, I think he is, phen- and he's phenomenal in this, too. Yeah. And, and like in this movie, so, like I said, so... The full spoiler. So you watch yeah. the movie the first time through and based on the trailer and based on what had been out in the general public about it, it's like, oh, it's just kind of like horror thriller movie set on an island that's like a prison island mental health facility where they're investigating the di- disappearance of an inmate and there's more going on that meets the eye and there's a conspiracy and stuff. So you go in from that perspective and, you you know, that's what people want to see because they, mm-hmm. they see the trailer. Like, oh, that's cool. That's from Scorsese. It's got DiCaprio. They go and you watch it. And then as you watch it, you get towards the end and you realize what's going on. Cause you get these kind of like non sequitur flashbacks to like Leonardo DiCaprio. Like he's seeing these things of like the Michelle Williams character, who's his wife and like his kids and stuff. And you're like, well, what does all this mean? And as you go throughout the movie, you have little tidbits and clues dropped for you. And then you get to the end of the movie and Ben Kingsley and then the kind of curtains gets pulled back and you realize what the movie really is, is that he's in a, he is a, an inmate at the mental health facility. He is the actual, like the fictional character he created for Elias Coteus to be mm-hmm. like the killer, the murderer of his family. That that's his name. And like his IMDB has his name is like his fictional name that he came up with. Like is the name he uses throughout the movie and not his actual name, like Andrew, um, Oh, was it Lee Ke- or Ketis or 
Keating or whatever. I'm forgetting off the top of my head now. But you you realize, okay, so um, you have all these things that are obscured when you watch it the first time through. And these elements, when you're watching it, the main thing is, does a movie like that with the big twist, does it hold together? Because like um, The Sixth Sense, a lot of movies, when you think about what the movie is and what the twist is, and you go back and rewatch it, like, does it work? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. with Shutter Island, I watched it the first time in theaters and really liked it, came out of it enjoying it a lot, and just hadn't gotten around to rewatching it. And I was like, well, does it, does it fit? And rewatching it, I think it does hold up. And rewatching it, it all makes sense and doesn't um, have. It's not one of those movies where it's just nonsensical plot developments that don't hold together at all mm-hmm. when you rewatch it. It all makes a lot of sense when you watch it again. Which you would expect out of uh, Scorsese. And Andrew Latus yeah. was the character, was his actual name. The, you know, the one thing I saw people point out was like, it's like, okay, whatever, is when did his memory reset? Did they just go out on the boat and circle around and all of a sudden, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think that probably, like, I get the idea of it, you know, it's like a video game where just like you hit play and yes, you start the game. Yeah. But I think, like, without going out of the backstory ever knowing whatever, I would assume they just told him, it's like, okay, we're going to take you to the island and blah, blah, blah. And he's probably bought it hook, line, hook, line, and sinker. And then and in then, the middle of the trip. Because they yeah. probably just took him to the other side of the island. Yeah. It's like, okay, you you know, we've assigned you to this and put him on the boat and yeah. then just drive it around or something. Okay, yeah. And he probably would buy into that delusion pretty easily because his entire thing was deluding himself to not admit what he had done. And that's why when you rewatch at the beginning, all the guards, you know, have their guns at the ready – Mm-hmm. with him because he has a firearm yeah and to, to build into the delusion so that's and, why and he so you know and it almost makes sense kind of a little bit but some of the acting in the beginning you know i don't know in the beginning it almost feels obviously the phenomenal actors but it almost feels almost like a stage play too yeah something about it just feels a little like hokey you know in some regards where it feels like that you know your impression of a 19. 1940- 40s detective you know from those films like yeah there's something about it that feels a little bit like that not too much to where it's off-putting but there's just some sort of it's other layer going on there or yeah like it feels like if it's a contemporary movie that has the exact same plot and is played straightforward then you might look at some of the performances and be like, oh, this is just a real caricature of this. Yes, yeah. But then when you rewatch it, you realize everybody in the movie is putting on a performance yeah. because the idea is instead of doing the frontal lobotomy to make uh, Latest less dangerous, Ben Kingsley tries to let him take the delusion to its full extent and let him play out his entire delusion to see that it's not real and it's just a coping mechanism for him to forget what he did and to not accept it and to blame, you know, external forces for what he allowed to happen. So he, you know, wants that to happen and and then hope and the hope is that once he gets to the end of the journey, he'll have the self-realization, you know, that, okay, I did do this. This is my fault. I need to deal with the fallout of it and try to become healthy and that was the hope instead of doing the lobotomy and they hoped that that would help them with other, you know, um, other cases mm-hmm. and you know research and prove things because health mental health at that time was not where it is now it's not perfect or great today yeah but back then it was you know throwing people locked up and you know the the funny farms and the mental asylums it was a vastly different place than it is today and the movie doesn't because sometimes movies have a tendency to make mental health be the butt of a joke mm-hmm. or played up for laughs or horror and it's still today um horror movies use mental illness as the excuse for everything and sometimes play it up in a way that's not very helpful. And this movie did not seem to do that. At the end of the movie, it's, hey, like, we're trying to take this seriously and trying to, you know, prove that you don't have to do these extreme measures. We can try to help people through therapy and realizing what's going on. And again, just to jump to the end of the film, it did seem to help him. Yeah. But he kind of... uh you know, they were like, hey, if you regress, they'll lobotomize you. And he, I think he basically, you know, intentionally gets lobotomized, you know, because yeah. he has that guilt. He's like, oh, screw well, it or think, whatever. Because I think that people involved with the movie had said that the ending was he realized what it was and he realized what he had done and he just feigned uh, regressing. Yes. So they would do yeah. it. And that's his entire line about would you rather live a monster or die yeah. a hero? Mm-hmm. And or die a good man or whatever it was a specific line was. So that's the reading of the movie mm-hmm. of, you know, he actually did realize it and just couldn't live with what he did and would rather just have it kind of, you know, knocked out of his skull literally. 
so he didn't have to live with what he had done. The other one is because I think the writer of the book had said that it was like a momentary glimpse of clarity. Like, so he wasn't, he wasn't fully like, he was not aware of, he had not, you know, made the realization and was in his, you know, regular state of mind, knowing what he had done the entire time and purposefully getting lobotomized just to not have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It was that he did literally regress, but had like a moment of clarity before it was going to happen. So there's like a couple of readings of how that could play out because it is ambiguous. My reading of it was always that he had realized what he had done and snapped out of his delusion But then just decided instead of living with the fact that, you know, his inaction let his wife kill their kids and he then killed her, he would rather just die with the delusion being that he's a detective trying to take down a conspiracy and find the killer of his family. And again, with the mental illness thing, you know, it's another message about like, hey, do something about it. You know, don't just let it go by the wayside with his wife because of that ignoring it, you know. Yeah, it calls like the worst possible thing to happen to his family. Yeah, because if he had taken action mm-hmm. and all that, then his wife would not have killed his and children. And there was more stigma around it then as well, where I'm sure yeah. people did not want to take action. And they don't um, want to be like, oh, my wife had to go to yes, see a psychiatrist. Yeah, yeah. And that's still even today. There are people mm-hmm. who, you know, would, you know, mental health, seeking mental health, they would see it as a weakness. Yeah. And it's just like, well, that's the complete wrong mindset because yeah. like if you have physical pain, you go to the doctor because people do have chemical imbalances. There's just a lot of things going on. And this movie doesn't like, there are some moments in the movie that are slightly, I mean, like it, it never really toes the line over into full exploitation of that type of stuff. Um, cause the Jackie Earl Haley character, um, cause he's fine. that's like locked up in the room mm-hmm. and it's one of those things when you watch the movie again, knowing the ending, that scene makes way more sense mm-hmm. because, um, the Jackie Earl Haley character is holding the conversation with Leo DiCaprio, you know, to his true self, to mm-hmm. who he actually is. And that conversation, watching it again, makes more sense. Because in the original movie, some of it didn't, it's just like, oh, is it the ravings of this kind of crazy yes, guy? Yeah. But then you rewatch, it's like, no, he's lucid and just telling, like, literally what happened. So there's all these things like that. that when you watch the movie again, it makes more sense. Um, it, so, you know, this is based on a book, as you mentioned, I, I did the same thing as you, I watched it once in theaters yeah. and it only seen, seen bits and pieces on TV first. This is my first time rewatching it again as well. And also I walked out of theaters really liking it, yeah. but it was also a film that it didn't grab me and connect with me in a way to where I did want to rewatch it or buy it or anything like that. Like I enjoyed it as a one shot through, um, you know, as a book, I can see it being very very good and satisfying um because but as a film and it's still a good film i think a really good film as a film you could see some audiences they walk in the door and they want to see a detective genre film and they want to see the detective solve it (laughs) and save the day and by the end of this film you don't get that you get you realize the rug is pulled out from anything you and as the audience member you have been delusional as to what is going on and granted the film has manipulated you but you know what I mean? You actually have not been seeing a detective yeah. solve a case. You've only been a part of his of his uh, Delusion. delusions. And that's the film there. Oh, I was delusional the whole time. And maybe this is how, you know, a perspective on this is how somebody with delusions may see the world. Yeah. We can't say for sure. I'm sure the writer yeah. seems probably he's probably probably pretty lucid considering he constructed this, you know, great uh uh, narrative in the book but at the same time you know that's kind of the point so it is one of those things when just like cabin in the woods yeah i want to see a straight horror film oh no wait the rug got put it from me i don't this is not what i wanted you know so you you could see a lot of people not being happy but also there have been people that have read into it thinking that oh wait his mind was just manipulated you know yeah. what i mean they they're covering it up or whatever yeah. but you know and they've said no that's actually not it but you can see people how they, you know, just like with the recent Star Wars films, you know, they try to make like, hey, well, maybe this, maybe Luke is actually not dead or, whoops, spoilers or whatever. But, yeah. um, you know what I mean? They start making up excuses because it's not what they wanted to see. But this, it's pretty clear. They've said it, it what it is. Yeah. Uh, but I could see that being dis- more disappointing to more film fans than it would be to uh, readers. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I think in a book it would be. I don't know. Even though you want a certain genre I think of a book, in a too. book, if you just get an idea of what, if you like, hear like, here's a book, and you read it, you're more open to following the journey of the story from its beginning mm-hmm. to its conclusion, and you're not as locked in in what you think it has to be. 
you're more open to things like, yeah. oh, okay, well, this has really changed my perception of the entire series of events. Yeah. I think people are more open to that in a book versus a movie where people very specifically go in with expectations, like you say, Cabin in the Woods. Mm -hmm. Somebody saw the trailer for Cabin in the Woods and they wanted the Evil Dead clone. And they go in and get this kind of subversive movie that kind of plays a lot of these things, you know, for jokes or laughs and, you know, plays all up and, you know, has metaphorical meaning and these like subplots and they watch it and there's comedy in it and there's things that go so far that it becomes comedy. Yeah. Um, Cause like towards the end of Cabin in the Woods when like all the things kind of happen at once. Yeah. That becomes comedy in the overabundance of yeah. it. It's it's and deconstructionist, which this isn't deconstructionist. It's just this is just a, um you get sold on one idea. Oh, and yeah. two, it wasn't the screenwriter that said that about the ending. It was a professor. I was the Wikipedia article. I confused it with one mm -hmm. of the other ones. It was a professor at New York University who said he thought it was a moment of clarity at the end, not the character of latest actually realizing everything and purposefully yeah. going. So there's a lot of interpretations. Like, and you said people even thinking that the movie was the entire time that he actually was, you know, the they were successful Teddy. in m making him delusional, not, and, you know, yeah. Like that is an interesting reading. I don't think the text of the movie supports no, that. No. Yeah. And that would have required Mark Ruffalo's character to be a plant from the beginning. Yes. And yeah. all that, even though he was a new partner that he had just worked with. Yeah. But, like, all the stuff does make sense, and the flashbacks do support all that. I, I, and then, like, the text of the movie does not support it being a planted delusion, because there's no point to do that if you're not going to have a sequel or more around the story. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe, maybe there is. But, like, to me, the... Because um, I'm more open into going into a movie and having it present one thing and slowly go into something else. Yeah. And in this case... As it goes along, it lays all these elements for you. They get him out of his detective uniform into like a different outfit. And just it slowly goes along with taking him from the, you know, yeah, see, where's the cigar? Yes, yeah. Um, gumshoe. It takes it from that to being the end of the movie where you're like, okay, rewatching this, it does hold together and it does make sense because everyone's interaction with him from the beginning. Because Ted Levine's character is very antagonistic to him or, you know, not, you know, very cold and, and, not welcoming at all and kind of, you know, treats him as if they have a pre-existing relationship. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. And, you know, John Carroll Lynch is like interaction with them makes sense. Yes. And yeah, I was very like, much looking at people's looks, you know what I mean? Because yeah. of the looks they were throwing and they don't, they don't project it too much to where it tells on your first time viewing, but yeah. you know, it's, it's a very fine balance. So there's a lot of things like that, that to me are, are, are fine and great because to me, a movie doesn't have to follow the, because there were so many of those noir films made. There's been so many TV series that took inspirations from it. So many movies that took inspirations from it. Comics, video games, all these things that have used those tropes of, you know, that type of era. And then to take what that story is. I mean, this is based on a book. So it's not like Scorsese came up with this idea out of his mm -hmm. head. But it's taking an idea of you present one thing. And then you see by the end of it that even though what you saw happened, it was all a charade and part of something else. Like... To me, that worked very well and made me come away from it really enjoying the movie and it didn't sour it. But I completely get somebody went in and they wanted one thing and then they watched it and then they're like, what the hell? Yeah. I wanted Sin City without yeah. the stylized graphics. Yeah. Because like Sin City had some similar stories of like well, people and, covering things up. And two, and, you don't, you know, we haven't seen, I haven't seen a Scorsese film. I don't know if any exists where um you know there is misdirection it, there is as much misdirection normally you know even just the you know the imagery thrown in the middle that kind yeah. of starts to foreshadow or maybe where his psyche starts breaking or maybe becoming more clear as the medicine is wearing off because that's another yeah. thing too he gets headaches and they, stuff. yeah they said he's he i guess he was having headaches because he was getting taken off his medicine and he was seeing more flashes of things yes. and, and memories so even though you know it's all but you know the scorsese films most of his other ones, you don't expect that from his films, yeah. you know. So it is another, it is another misdirection on that end because it's not what you expected of Scorsese. Yeah, if you watch like The Wolf of Wall Street and Goodfellas, they're very similar movies structurally. Yeah, um, one mean, of is, them, yeah, like one of them's like going up through the crime world, and one's going up through Wall Street, yeah. which isn't that different from the crime world. Um, and then you know, like Taxi I mean, Driver. I mean, taxi Driver has somebody. Bull. Taxi Driver has somebody breaking. But it is never in this way. You know it's what I mean? There's never yes. forward, mm -hmm. outward appearance, yeah. not as much internalized yeah. visions. And, you know, other Scorsese movies, um, 
like you said, they're they're straightforward because like Taxi Driver is kind of like an outsider's perspective as you see him doing things. This movie's showing inward stuff, what mm-hmm. what DiCaprio's character Cadis or Latus is seeing himself, and that just gives a different perspective than what you expected. So to me, getting a movie from a filmmaker well into their career that defies yes. a lot of what they did before with top notch talent. That looks amazing. There's no CGI. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's CGI, but there, nothing that's Some noticeable. of the scenes that look like they were definitely green screen because my yeah. wife was like, ooh, this doesn't look good. No. Like she thought some of it looked terrible. And I'm like, I don't think it looks terrible. I think some of it looks maybe noticeable, but I was like, it looks much better than some stuff. Like it was off putting to her, but yeah. yeah, it wasn't, it's not a big CGI fest. It looks yeah. way better than uh, the last Indiana Jones green screen. Well, I mean, like you have like yeah. some stuff like when the house is burning or when yeah. Michelle Williams it, characters. Well, mainly apart. it was them on the boat because it's so steady. Yeah. And it just is like, and I said, well, maybe this is supposed to be like, you know, uh, the feel of those films too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and the imagery of like, Hey, this is like kind of the feel of something not totally real. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think it's just how they shot or like whenever they're driving, um, in the cars, like kind of going by, it's basically just the lighting on their face doesn't change. Yeah. And all the, you know, they're in the sun and things are changing well, behind them. It's simple yeah. stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, I was just, well, stuff like that, like to me, the opening on the boat that was so in line with what you expected from like a noir story. Yes, yeah. That is kind of bought whatever That's what it I told was. her too. I was like, I think it maybe is just, you know, maybe partially intentional. You know what yeah. I mean? The fact that it looks just so much like an older one of those films. Well, I guess too, like I would watch stuff like Mad Men a lot and, you know, like that's mostly characters in locations, like yeah. when they're driving or whatever. It's all kind of like that. Yeah. So I guess maybe I just have a little more tolerance because I'm used to watching yeah. so much kind of and those two, period. The way I have my parents' TV right now, it's a 60 inch TV setting like from here to where this camera is. Yeah. So like we're seeing on a huge screen right there and it's like, you know, you can tell more. Um, but yeah, this film would have been very different if In Night Shyamalan would have directed it. Yeah, not, because not, not if anything would have been changes, but your expectations walking into the theater, like you were just waiting for to like... To see what the twist all right, is. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I expect. Scorsese, you expect a straightforward detective film. Yeah, and you're, you know, because you like this is a guy that's done Goodfellas and all these things. And two, like some of the reviews at the time, it got generally favorable reviews. It has generally favorable critics' reviews. I do think it got a relatively low cinema score, like a C minus or C or not an, because typically anything less than an A minus is seen as not like a uh, audience favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, not saying that the audience members came out saying this is a terrible movie. I think a lot of it's just expectation versus reality because a Transformers movie can get an A minus because people went in expecting cars fighting cars, blowing stuff up, and girls being shot as if they're cars themselves and being sexualized. So they go in expecting one thing, um, not to uh, generalize the entire <laughs> yeah. audience, but you saw, so the first Transformers you saw had Megan Fox and the, and the robots in it and it was directed by Michael Bay. You knew what you were getting and you went in and it gave you that. So people came out saying, yeah, that was, that was, that was fun. Um, you go into Shutter Island and they go in expecting this kind of detective story and get like a mental health parable you know, and then they're like, well, uh, that wasn't what I wanted. So it's just like food. You can love Italian food, mm-hmm. but if you expected Mexican food and you get Italian food, you could be disappointed. Yeah. So I think it's just a lot of things like that. So I, I think it has, though, on IMDb. Like it has generally good ch- critic reviews. 8.1 on IMDb, which yeah. is very high for that. Yeah. So I just think that like the online review community might be a little bit detached from the general audiences walking out of the theaters. Um, but I do think that generally critics liked it. People who watched it enjoyed it. Um, I think that, you know, it has a good reputation. Some critics said that he was slumming it in the genre film. Uh, but I think that with the elements in it, it wasn't a, like a cash in kitschy cliched no. movie. There was more going on in it. And the big thing is just, like I said, this movie's made in 2010. It was set, you know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever set in the past post world war two, a lot of movies today about mental health handle it more clumsily mm-hmm. set in contemporary times. Mm-hmm. Cause like the movie unsane had some stuff in it. Cause it's about a girl in a mental health institution. And there's some stuff about that that was problematic. And that lights was shot out. recently. Yeah. Lights out, which that's is, the one I always think of that. I was like, Ooh, when I saw that in theaters, well, I think that that one, Surprising. like, I think that one like rewrites and shoots and editing yeah. and all that kind of crafted an ending that didn't fall in line with what their intention was. Yeah. And if taken out of context, you're like, well, that just said to do this. Yeah. And then you listen to the commentary of the director and thing. And that wasn't their intention. It's what it ended up through editing. Yeah. 
and which I can see that too. Out. But that is it ended up. That's what the film was. Yeah, that's what you, that's the you walked out of the theater, film. and that's what you got from it. You you know, if you're just watching the film, as ninety percent of the audience probably. Now, does. I guess you could come away from Shutter Island saying, "Is the moral of the story if you can't live with what you've done, let someone yeah. lobotomize you?" Yeah. But I think that was more of just that guy specifically. His entire mm-hmm. life, he was in World War II. He was a U.S. Marshal before all that happened. A duly appointed federal marshal, <laughs> and uh, before you know, he commit before he you know ignored all the warning signs with his wife because she had you know burnt their apartment. So instead, he took her out to like uh, by the lake. So instead of you know trying to do something about it, his pride said, you know, don't do anything about it. Because at that time, like you said, there was a stigma around mental health and, and all that. And mm-hmm. back then, it wasn't as effective as it is now. Yeah. So you just have these elements. So, like, I don't think Scorsese was slumming it in genre film. I think it was just doing a project that wasn't in line with everything else he had done. And I think yeah. having having a quote-unquote classy filmmaker work on this versus a more genre-heavy filmmaker, I think, made the end result be what it was. Because, mm-hmm. like you said, M. Night Shyamalan... At that point in his career, though, he had had some duds. So I think he was kind of out of the running. But, you know, because um, we initially had planned to shoot two podcasts back to back, but timing worked out or not. The other one was The Village, which is another kind of movie with a twist. That's what I was thinking because I was I've been really busy. So I was like yeah. trying to and I was like, actually, I can't just put these on, even though I've seen them both before, yeah. because I need to pay attention to, you know, the things that it that it maybe uh kind of shows you early on yeah. like these clues like i actually need to watch both these films to see it through a new lens and like something with like so this movie i saw it in the theater i saw it in the theaters fresh didn't know any of the plot twist and came out of it really enjoying it the village i did not see in theaters and that had it spoiled for me as soon as it hit uh, theaters because somebody said well this is the ending yeah so when i rewatched it because i only rewatched it from beginning to end recently yeah so that movie is just like does it does, does the plot twist hold yeah and what does the expectation all this stuff do? But like with Shutter Island, um, like I said, if this was an M. Night Shyamalan movie, I think everyone would have approached it differently. And I think if it was an M. Night Shyamalan movie at the time that came out, people would have probably hated it just because <laughs> of what his reputation yeah. became at but that point. I'm just saying somebody who is traditionally known for having twists, you know what I mean? Yeah. You would have, I don't know, maybe people would have been more but accepting you, of it you, because they would have known there's going to be a well, twist. Say, you say know? they had handed this movie to Robert Rodriguez post Sin City you get a completely different movie yeah. or Tarantino or yeah. any of those types of filmmakers. Um, but I think Scorsese brought like a level of class to it yeah. that made it all work. But um, yeah, I guess we can kind of like, so what would you give it out of 10? I, you know, it's once again, the reviews so are all pointless. It's, it's like a really well-crafted film from really talented people, but at the same time, nothing I have a huge affinity for. Yeah. I enjoyed watching it in theaters, walked out theaters. Like that was cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed that experience. But it was really nothing ever that I cared too much about going back to. Yeah. Um, like, it's weird. I feel like it deserves higher, but I don't know, maybe like a seven. Like, I feel like it deserves yeah. an eight, you know, because yeah. it is a good, well-crafted film and I did enjoy it. I do enjoy it, but I just don't have any affinity to ever really watch it again. Like, I probably yeah. wouldn't have watched it all the way through, you know, within the next maybe like 20 or 30 years. I yeah. would, you know what I mean? Like, unless it was a podcast. So yeah. I don't want to give it too much credit because maybe it's just the nature of the film, but I love all the actors in it. Yeah. Scorsese does an amazing job. I, you know, there's some amazing shots in there. Just the World War II thing when he's looking down yeah. and the papers are blowing behind him. Like, you know, it's just Scorsese, you know, yeah. the panning shot of whenever they're lining everybody, the terrible shot in of, the World War II. When they were, yeah. and, they, and they pan by and like Nazi somebody runs the- and then DiCaprio fires and everybody shoots and that, that tracking shot. Like, I think that is, you know, it's just Scorsese directing. Yeah. So it's just... You know, but on the whole, like I have to take it on the whole, probably about a seven. Yeah. Yeah. I think I go a little bit higher. Like, you know, like once again, all these reviews are relative yeah. and mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything because giving like face off a nine or an eight or whatever, yeah. it doesn't mean it's a better movie than other things. Like to me, it's like an eight. Yeah. Um, Cause I like in the, the in theater experience of watching it and seeing it kind of unfold and have this kind of misdirect ending that to me worked because a mm-hmm. lot of times misdirect endings mm-hmm. you watch and you're like, really? That was stupid. That that undermined everything that came before it. Um, but then rewatching, I was like, oh, okay. So they actually did lay out clues and a lot of it does hang together and make sense. All the actors are great. There's a lot of great shots in it. Um, you know, it's just one of those movies that we probably don't get very often anymore, kind of higher budgeted. I know like Netflix is producing Scorsese's The Irishman movie from net like this coming out on Netflix. So there's like some movies like that that he's, he got that budget for silence, Scorsese did, but on the whole, you don't get many kind of genre tilted movies with kind of A-list cast and 
um, you know, big budgets and, you know, practical sets and all this stuff. You don't get as much of that anymore. Uh, so it's a movie that will probably occasionally get movies like this that aren't sci-fi or, you know, some heavy genre twist. Like, you know, the if it skews horror, the budget tends to be lower. Um, if it skews higher, then it tends to be like sci-fi or, you know, these other Which more I think this was genres. an $80 million dollar budget. Yeah, so, you know, comparable to... I'm trying to think of other movies that have been comparable to this in recent years, because there aren't a ton. Seems like it's like 60, you know, like really low. Yeah. Like... 60 million dollars or like 150 million yeah, it, you know or 120 yeah because so many yeah. movies exist like 20 or below yeah 100 or above there's not as many yeah. movies between like 20 and 100 anymore yeah um just because that's a high enough budget that they need to recoup it but a 60 million dollar drama might only make 60 million yeah. so they need to make it for 10 instead but yeah it's a movie i enjoyed it's something that if you haven't watched it since the original theatrical run it's on amazon prime so you can watch it now it's on hulu also or, okay yeah so it's on a few services mm-hmm. so you can go check it out and see if you think it hangs together as well as it did during the first one or if you didn't enjoy it the first time does it hang together better on a second viewing but uh i guess i'll ramp up our discussion of shutter island if you're listening via itunes you can do us a huge favor leave a review there it helps other people find the podcast uh, moves up moves us up the podcast charts if you're listening via youtube we always enjoy seeing comments there got a lot of new subscribers this month so thank you if you're listening for the first time yeah because i guess i think it was that that top mm-hmm. five scary movies so we yeah. need to like the reason we haven't done as many videos like that is it's you're so at risk for getting things pulled because of copyright yeah. um, and the return strikes. just wasn't big on them you know we get a yeah. couple hundred views starting out but they do grow over time for sure well that one was just the youtube algorithm for whatever yeah. reason made it show up so hopefully they do it for other stuff but um you know if you're listening from that like if there's types of videos you'd like to see us do you can always comment or you can send us an email at podcast at house com. you know you can also send recommendations for things to us things for us to watch because we do try to plan out episodes you know in advance somewhat and figure out things to watch a lot of times it just comes down to what's easy for everyone to watch because I know, like, you know, you having a child and, like, Derek and his girlfriend having, like, multiple dogs and jobs and, <laughs> yeah. and me having stuff going on. There's just a lot of things going on, so we try to schedule things out. So a lot of times it comes down to what's easy to watch. But if there's something you think would be really great for us to cover, uh, let us know. I want us, I want us to do some De Palma soon. Yeah. Because we haven't done any De Palma, right? Not that I remember. I don't think we've done any De Palma. And then we talked about me doing Die Hard this summer at some yeah. point, too, you know, because it is the 30th anniversary yeah. this summer. Um, but yeah, let us know some movies we haven't done. Cause we've, we've made through some, you know, we've made some, a lot of some good headway yeah. here in the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you can also find everything we're doing at house Find links here to all our social media accounts. Make sure to follow us on Instagram. It's HBTVS underscore official. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and all those places. And then if you want to follow us specifically in the internet, uh, the best place to find me is on Instagram at the William Caps. And I'm at Italian Elon Musk. <laughs> at Blevin <Blevin's> Sean. <laughs> yep. And that'll wrap up this episode of the House Pavia Store Podcast. Thanks for listening. House by the